is Ashley, and this is my testimony. All right, guys, so welcome back. It's been a minute, I know, I'm sorry. I've been healing a lot with God, actually, and I wanted to share it with you. I was going to do a, you know, like a more fun day in the life video, and then God said, you're gonna film another testimony, which I wasn't planning on filming another testimony, but he wanted me to, and I, will be obedient to the Lord. So he wants me to talk about my battle with lifelong depression and how he delivered it from me in the last few weeks. I'm finally free from depression. I honestly never thought I could say that. And I'm still like reeling. Like I just can't believe, actually I can, I can believe because I know how good God is and how faithful he is. And I'm so excited that I actually can sit down here and tell you this testimony because I never would have thought in a million years that I would be able to speak these words, that I'm free from depression for the first time in my entire life. I feel like this is gonna be a long one. I grab a snack and get comfy or a drink or whatever because we're gonna go, we're going in on this one. So we're gonna start with my life, you know, my childhood, teenage years. We're just gonna go through each season and how I was when it came to depression through those seasons and then how God worked on me and worked on my life, what he had me change, what he had me do and how he ultimately freed me and delivered me from a life of depression. So let's get into it. I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1987. I'm about to be 36 actually. And I had a relatively normal childhood, but I almost died when I was two weeks old. And I feel like the enemy was already trying to prevent me <laughs> from ever giving a testimony. I think that the enemy knows God's plans for us. He knew that one day I would be filming testimonies or I'd be sharing testimonies or I'd be doing something, some sort of work with, with God, however that was going to look. And he did not want that to happen. So... I started experiencing spiritual warfare at two weeks old. So my mom was just telling me yesterday actually, which is odd that I'm filming this, the story again of what, what kind of happened when I was two weeks old. So I became ill and my mom brought me to the hospital and I was throwing up and all this. And you know, it's a two week old baby. She didn't know, and it was her first baby. She didn't know what was going on. So she brings me to the hospital. They say, oh, she's just a little sick. And they sent her home. Didn't do all the testing that they probably should have done. So we get home and my mom was obviously extremely intuitive and listening to God. And God was telling her something's not right with your baby. Like this is, you have to see somebody else. Like you got to go back. So she ends up calling the PCP or the pediatrician instead. And the pediatrician is like, bring her in right now. Like she's two weeks old. Like this is not normal. So she brings me to the pediatrician. The pediatrician does a urinalysis and I had a UTI at two weeks old. Like, how is that even possible, right? And it's actually not that common. So it was so severe though that I was becoming septic. And if they waited any longer, I would not have made it. So here I am, <laughs> I made it, but I can only imagine what my parents were going through, you know, and I could have stored that trauma. You know, we all have trauma, but even when you're an infant, you're picking up on everything that's going on around you. I mean, that was a literal near death experience at two weeks old. So already experiencing spiritual warfare. Let's fast forward a little bit to, I was two years old and I, that was the first time I had a ghost. And I will never forget every little detail about this ghost. This ghost would come to my room at night when everybody was sleeping, of course, and would lay in my bed. <laughs> Like we're going in already guys, but I would have, I had this ghost and I called it the farmer, which is so creepy, so creepy. And I remember what he was wearing, everything. I, I, all of it, it was just so detailed, still etched in my memory, so terrifying. And I would run out every time and, you know, scream to my mom, like there's somebody in my bed. It, it's a, he looks like a farmer. I mean, just so creepy guys. And you know, my mom didn't really know what to tell me at that time because I was, two years old, like I wasn't gonna comprehend whatever she said. And my mom has experienced a lot of spiritual warfare herself, a lot of paranormal things. And she's also very sensitive in that way, like I am. So she was scared because she knew, you know, this is weird, like this kid is only two <laughs> and she's already having this type of stuff happen to her. So I don't remember what she said, but eventually it did stop. I don't have any memories of essay or anything crazy like that. No, like, I don't wanna say the words on here because 
I know YouTube is sensitive like that, but A-B-U-S-E. No, I never had anything like that. But I do wanna give a disclaimer for parts of this video. I am gonna go, like, they, it, it's a heavy video, so I'm gonna go into some detail. So we're gonna talk about promiscuity, binge drinking, and SI, so ideation. Okay, so if that triggers you, this is probably not the video for you, but I forgot to give the disclaimer at the beginning. Yeah, so I didn't have like a, some crazy childhood or anything like that. I, it was relatively normal. I went to public school. I lived behind a creek and I was in nature all the time. And I honestly spent a lot of time alone, guys. Like that was, I remember being alone a lot, but I wanted to be alone. I was extremely sensitive and I felt most comfortable just doing my own thing. And I'm still kind of like that. I do like to go on adventures by myself and just, 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 Part of my personality. So spent a lot of time alone, never felt like I fit in. I always felt like the oddball or just, I've always been the type that I would kind of observe versus just jumping into things. And I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to be like everybody else. I wanted to be more extroverted and the type of person that, you know, just flies by the seat of their pants, but that just wasn't my personality. So yeah, I spent a lot of time alone. I was a little bit shy. I had some friends, but I usually had one friend at a time. Like I honestly don't even know if I could handle more than one friend at a time. I just always had one best friend at a time. And you know, we would go in nature, play outside, all the things. I would, I would draw in color for eight hours a day. That was a huge part of my childhood was just, I had an artist's soul, an artistic soul. But even though my childhood was normal, I always felt a heaviness. And I now am looking back and seeing that that was, I was oppressed. I was already being oppressed. And I guess people would call it a depression. Like that's what it kind of felt like. It was almost like I was oppressed by the enemy and it caused me to be depressed because I just felt this weight all the time, even as a kid, guys. It's interesting to look back now and realize what that was. And it was just, it was spiritual oppression, I think, now. So that could have been also why I was super feeling like I was different or something was different about me or I just didn't feel like I wasn't like every other kid or there was just something. And it followed me. It felt like a heavy cloud. And so then I get to middle school and I'm about 13 or 14. And I start to discover boys. I start to discover all of the things that the devil wanted me to find and cling on to because I had that heaviness on me. And the only time I felt free from it was drinking, smoking weed, being promiscuous with boys or whatever. And it just was what it was. Like that's how I filled the void that I had in my heart and filled the heaviness. And so 13, 14, I started smoking weed here and there. I remember a time where I thought that weed wasn't a gateway drug, which is so funny looking back because it really, it totally was. It That opened the door to alcohol and, what, and then partying and binge drinking and you know, all of the things. <laughs> So for me, it was a gateway drug. So then I got heavy into alcohol and my friends and I would just look for the next party constantly every week. That's all we cared about was literally blacking out drinking. And there are so many things that I don't remember guys. Like, and it's, I am so lucky and I can look back now and see that God was with me the whole time that I was going through my teenage years in college and all, all the years that I just didn't really know God, he was still there. He was still there. And there were so many times that I was in weird situations that I shouldn't have been in that were unsafe or something could have gone terribly wrong. And he always somehow saved me, but he also let me get hurt a lot because I wasn't listening to him. At this point at, at middle school and high school, I just wanted to fit in so badly, guys. I wanted people to like me. I wanted boys to like me. I wanted girls to like me, whatever. I wanted everybody to like me, especially boys. So I started dressing revealing. I started to wear a lot of makeup. I started to really get into drinking even more. I mean, that's like all we cared about was drinking. I swear, like looking back, that's all anybody cared about. We were listening to Eminem, 50 Cent, all of those rappers at the time. It was the early 2000s. And you know, this whole time I was still feeling oppressed. I never felt right. I just never felt right in my body. I didn't really like myself. In fact, I think I hated myself for a lot of it. And so I would just try to leave my body as much as possible. I just wanted to feel some sort of relief <laughs> from this world. And the only way I could do that was drinking and smoking weed. I continued to do that into college. 
And at that time I did have a boyfriend, but he was into that stuff too. So we would just do it together. We would drink together, smoke weed together and overeat together, binge eat together. I mean, it was just gross. And that relationship was extremely toxic, extremely toxic. It was seven years long. It was definitely a narcissistic type of relationship. I'm not saying I was a good guy by any means. I was totally enabling all of this horrible behavior that he did. So at some point in that relationship, I realized I want better for myself. So I decided I was gonna go to pharmacy school. And of course, since it was a toxic relationship, he made fun of me and put me down for it. And he said, oh, are you just gonna count pills for the rest of your life? And he just didn't, he didn't want me to excel or exceed beyond him put it that way. So pretty much all of my life, I felt stuffed down. I just felt like pushed down, smashed down, oppressed. Like even my boyfriend was telling me these things and he would, you know, just say the meanest things to me, guys. Like he, he told me I was ugly all the time. And then the next day he loved me. And then the next day he hated me. And it was just absolutely insane. <laughs> um, but I eventually I got out of that and I went to pharmacy school. Now in pharmacy school was when I finally realized something is not quite right with me, like mentally. I think I have anxiety and I was starting to have panic attacks. So then I finally started to understand like maybe I have a mental health situation going on here. So I decided I'm in pharmacy school now. It's really grueling. It's a lot of pressure. Maybe I should get on medication. And I'm not saying medication is bad or good. It just depends on the person. But for me, it was horrible and it did not help me at all. In fact, it made my life worse. And I would switch medications all the time to try to figure it out and nothing ever really worked. And if it did, it would eventually stop working and I would have to try something else. I remember a point where I was just like, this is, I don't think this is the way, <laughs> this, this is really isn't the way for me. Like I know that I can heal and I'm not sure this is healing me. It felt like a band-aid. And so this was in my mid twenties, early to mid twenties. <laughs> I remember there was a point where I had switched to medication and I blacked out while driving because guys, these medications have serious side effects. And I was just using SSRIs. I wasn't even using anything severe and it wasn't even high doses or anything, but I blacked out driving and like woke up confused. And I was like, that was that medication. So I stopped that one. That scared the heck out of me. But then I started another one and you were to take it in the morning. I took it in the morning, another situation where I like blacked out driving and I, I hit a car. <laughs> I could have died there too. And I hit a car and Luckily, everything was fine, but I remember thinking, okay, I really need to, to not use these medications because they're not helping and they're causing me to black out while driving and I am just got in a car accident. Like, this is enough. Enough is enough. So I got off all, I got off that, all that, never went back to it and realized, you know, there's another way. So I just suffered though. I mean, I didn't do anything for, with it. Like, I didn't know what else to do. So I just threw myself into pharmacy school. So that was like my crutch, put it that way. And I love to learn, so I was okay at that point, but I still had that underlying depression feeling. And at this point I didn't, I wouldn't have said that I'm depressed. Like I felt more comfortable saying that I had anxiety. And I think that's because of the stigma of mental health is that I, I was just ashamed or embarrassed by it. So I thought, you know, anxiety is more common or people, you know, most people have anxiety. So I'll just say I have anxiety, but I refuse to see the depression. I refuse to acknowledge it until honestly, probably a couple years ago or even recently, like I just was in denial about it. So after pharmacy school, well, during pharmacy school, I get into another relationship. It ends up also being toxic in a different way. This time it was just extremely codependent. I didn't know who I was. I was relying on him for happiness and I was miserable. You know, the first year was pretty good, but I still wasn't super happy. I, again, I used him for happiness and I didn't have God then. So I, it was very difficult for me to see past that relationship. Like it, it, he was my everything at that time. So whenever that relationship ended, I felt like my heart was literally ripped out of my body because he was number one. I, there was no God. It was just him. And he was, I relied on him. And so I'll never forget that feeling, how horrible that felt, how broken I was after that. And I can see looking back now what God was doing in my life. You know, at the, all those times I was in so much pain and I just didn't understand 
And now I can see that he was building my testimony. He was, he was using my sin and my pain to eventually use it for good. So like I said, he let me get hurt. God will let you get hurt sometimes. So when I was in that relationship though, I was, I was still self-soothing with other things. We would drink together, smoke weed, overeat together and do all that. Just like I did with the last boyfriend, except this guy was actually a good, he was a good person. And he didn't, he wasn't like mean to me or anything like that. But we weren't equally yoked and it just wasn't for the long term. So yeah, it had to end. So, so I become single and I decide I'm going to go, you know, date around and sleep around and all that. And I just, it wasn't fulfilling. It was horrible guys. Like it, I don't recommend that. Don't try to find happiness in another person ever. That's just not where happiness comes from. It comes from within you and your relationship with the Lord. That is the only way you can be happy. And I didn't know that then. And if anybody ever talked about God or Jesus or anything, I would like laugh and scoff and be like disgusted by it. I just wanted nothing to do with that because I wanted to soothe myself with my coping mechanisms that I had. After that relationship ended, I stopped smoking weed, which was good, but I was still going out partying and, you know, fooling around with guys and doing all the things that people do in their 20s that they in 30s that you know culture says is cool and I want again I, I always wanted to fit in I always tried to fit in I always tried to do the worldly things and it never felt right for me and just never felt right and never made me feel better that's when I fell into the new age and I already did three videos on new age so I'm not gonna you know ha rehash that again because you guys can I've already watched that or you can go back and watch my new age videos but that was my new thing that I could cling to so that was my everything. It was literally my everything. I was attached to this spiritual persona that I had within new age. And that was my soothing mechanism. Now I wasn't drinking anymore. I wasn't smoking anymore. I wasn't sleeping around anymore. I I've been celibate for years, guys. Like I haven't dated. I've been single for six, seven years. So at some point I just became addicted to new age. And that was my thing. That was my thing. Even though I had given up all these other things, I still had a thing. <laughs> there was still a thing there to try to make me feel better. And I couldn't heal. Like I, there were periods of time where I would feel happier, but there was never a baseline of like normal happiness, like a normal person, normal peace, like that a lot of people do have that I always strived for. And I just couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. I was like walking in circles, trying to find this feeling of peace and happiness. And I just couldn't find it. So yeah, there were moments that I would feel a little bit happy like when I would do new age practices sometimes they did work but they were always fleeting they never stuck I'd be like happy for a couple days and then I'd go back to feeling like my old self again again it just didn't stick because it wasn't true healing it was all band-aids all of the stuff that we try to fix ourselves with and try to heal ourselves with it's just a lot of the times it's a it's a band-aid and really it's a call to Christ it's trying to get you closer to God and for you to wake up and say, God, I can't do this alone anymore. I, I, I just can't do it anymore. I've had enough. And so I did get to that point and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so well, let's fast forward now to when I was saved and right before I was saved. So God was already working on me before I was saved around that time on, my, on healing my depression. So he had me do a few things. So the first thing he had me do was it was last April. And I remember thinking, I, I can't stay in this apartment anymore where I was in Pittsburgh, PA. I thought I've moved all over this area. Nothing's changed. It's the same people. It's the same problems. It's the same everything. It's just not for me anymore. And guys, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it's not a bad area, but it, it just wasn't for me anymore. You know, it's all about drinking and sports and it's freezing there most of the year. And I hate the cold. I hate, it's not that I hate sports, but I, they're just not my, um, they're not my thing. Like I don't care to watch sports. And I also wasn't really drinking anymore. So I just felt like, well, I've never fit in here. And now I really don't fit in. Like I have to go, like it's time for me to go. And I know God was nudging me and saying it's time. And I remember my rent was like hundreds of dollars more for the next year when they sent me to resign my lease. And I was like, I will literally go into debt if I stay here. And there's nowhere else in this town that I would even want to live. I was like, I think it's time. And I always knew that I was going to move near the ocean. I just didn't know what that was going to look like, how or when or what. And God said, it's time girl, like let's go. <laughs> so I found an apartment within a day guys, I, it was like all so perfect, all set up so perfectly. And I find a lot of times when it, that when God blesses you, it's just easy and it just works and it just happens. Like, it's just like, boom, 
boom, boom. So I get my apartment squared away. Everything's good. I move in July of 2022. I moved to the beach with my cat and I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what I was in for, but I was trusting. And at this time I did believe in God, but I was still into new age practices. So I wasn't fully with God yet. I wasn't saved yet, but I still was listening to God's guidance at this time. So I knew that this is what I had to do. I had to go to an environment that I actually enjoy where there's sunshine and nature that I can be out in and there's you know warm weather I hate cold weather it was just it was just so obvious like this this has to happen such a freeing feeling driving you know I got up at three in the morning packed my stuff packed my cat up in the car and I was like I don't know what's gonna meet me down there I don't know what's gonna happen but the funniest thing about it is that I met God when I got here that's that was his plan his plan was to get me out of my environment that I've always hated that I never loved and put me somewhere that I could actually thrive and be happy. So sometimes it's something somewhat simple that will help you be free of depression. So that was one of the things. He did a whole list of things with me that I'm gonna go through, but that was the first key was to get out of my old environment. And we hear a lot that saying like, you can't heal in the environment that made you sick. And I truly believe that, I really do guys. I couldn't get out of this funk that I was in for my entire life in that environment. I just couldn't, like no matter what I did. And he saw me trying and struggling and he, and he was there, he was there, he knew. He knew I couldn't. So he helped me get down south. The second I got here, I was like, yep, this this was God. This is a blessing. I'm so happy to be here. But I still had that oppressive feeling, okay? So I wasn't like healed from it, I, but I was definitely happier. So I finally left the drinking town with a football problem and I'm in a beautiful, beautiful place with palm trees and sun and oceans and beaches all over that I could go, I could go to a different beach every day and I just can't even believe how blessed I am, but something still didn't feel right, guys. Like, and it wasn't like where I was. It just was like, I think I'm getting somewhere, but am I, you know, I'm making all these changes, but I still have that heaviness, that heavy feeling on me. But you know, I continued on. And I remember before I left, I was telling people, yeah, you know, I'm gonna find a yoga studio down there. I'm gonna go, you know, get back to yoga as soon as I get there and all that. And the second I moved here, I just felt this feeling of, I never really wanna do yoga again. And I didn't know why at the time. I still wasn't saved, but I just felt like I was pulling away from yoga and meditation and all that and more towards more towards God. And I remember three different people were like, oh, you, you need to find a church there right away. You gotta find a church. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'll, yeah, I'll find a church. That would be good to have a community, but I think I'm gonna find a yoga studio first. And it's like funny looking back because the second I got here, I felt called to God in church and less into all that stuff. But I was still practicing that stuff though, guys. Like it wasn't like I just stopped out of nowhere. It was like a slow progression. So I moved down here and I moved right in view of a church, which is so funny how God works. I was like, I think that's a sign. And I'd be like, you know, sitting on my balcony, like watching the people to and go, go to and from Sunday service. And I would always be like, that might be kind of nice. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that sometime. But I, I just never would do it. I never would do it. So I was trying to do other things. And then God said, you need to volunteer. So I was like, okay, I'm going to volunteer. So I started volunteering. And that took some of the pressure off me. So I started to volunteer once a week and that's been super helpful, honestly, for anyone that's suffering with mental health. One of the best things you can do is take the focus off yourself and help others. Sometimes when you're mental, mentally not with it or stuff's going on mentally, it's like all you can think about is your own stuff and your own problems and your own stuff going on. So it's very helpful to just get out into the community and help others in that way and serve in that way. So I started doing that. Okay, so fast forward to November 2022, November 4th. It was the day that I was saved and the day that I was born again. I'll never forget it because it was one of the best days of my life. And God is good, guys. So he's, so I'm saved now. And I start going to church and I start going to Bible studies. That's really helpful, having that community. So God was starting to work in my life in that way, bringing me into the community of the church. And that was very healing for me. And then I come across fasting and I had never done a fast before, but I was so called to it, guys. I was just like, I have to do this. So I decide I'm going to fast for depression. I finally admitted it to myself. I was like, I'm saved now. God healed me from so many things. 
so many things, guys. But there was still that one piece that I hadn't healed from yet that I was still struggling with. And I thought, you know, he's done so much for me. Like, what what would it hurt to just fast for it? Let's see, you know, let's see if we can actually work together on this because I just can't heal this alone. And I know that. And I'm finally admitting to myself that that peace is there. That oppression is still on my life that I still have that low feeling and I don't know why. And I believe in the Bible, it does say that there are some demons that can only be removed through fasting and prayer. So I was like, you know what? This is a stronghold on my life. This is a generational curse. I think the only way I'm going to break this is through fasting and prayer. And I might have to do it more than once. I wasn't sure, but I was like, I'm going to at least do my best. And I know now that it is a generational curse and I can see what side of the family it's on and all that. And I was like, you know what? I am not going to continue living this way. I am going to be the one that stops this. I don't want to pass this to my kids. This is just a horrible way to live. God doesn't want us to be depressed. He doesn't want that for us. And I know that. So I called on God and I said, let's do a fast together. And I decided it was going to be 10 days. I wasn't going to do 21 because I wanted to start slow just to see. I got all the stuff ready. You know, I was grocery shopping, doing all the things. And God was like, you're going to start right now. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start right now. <laughs> so I started the fast early. And actually, let me get my journal from that fast because I decided to journal each day. And I think it'll be fun to read some of these with you because I was still depressed for the first eight days of my fast. It wasn't like it. I was just healed automatically. And it was probably the hardest eight days that I've ever experienced in my life. I mean, guys, I just was so hurting. It was like all of the pain that I was trying to suppress with different things and self-soothe were just in front of me now. And I didn't have anywhere to go, but I had God. And that was the only thing that got me through it. I had Jesus, you know, Jesus healed me from this. And it was also hard because I love coffee and I didn't do any coffee, of course, because I did the Daniel fast. And guys, my head was just about to explode. I mean, I'm talking, I had mental anguish, emotional pain, physical pain. It was all the things at once. But for some reason, I knew that I was going to be healed. I just could feel it. And one of the first things God had me do during that fast was to delete Instagram and delete Netflix. And those were a couple of things that I, you know, I, I, would deactivate Instagram pretty often, like on and off just to take breaks from it. But he was like, no, no, you're going to delete it for at least a year. And I want you to see how your life looks without that and without Netflix because it's garbage. I remember I was trying to watch a show, guys, <laughs> like a dating show or something. And the TV like would not work. It kept sh the TV kept shutting off. And I heard God say loud and clear, stop watching this. Like you're not watching this anymore. Like you're different now. You're not the old you. And it wasn't like the bachelor or something like that. It was like a trashy one. And I was like, yeah, I didn't feel good to watch that. So I listened. <laughs> so I stopped watching that. And then I deleted Netflix. So I want you to be able to see like, what were the things he was doing in my life? Like I had, it wasn't like he just automatically healed me. He wanted me to make these changes. He had things that I needed to do. And he has things that you might need to do in your life to be healed from something. Another thing he had me do during this fast was increase my hours at work, which is inter was interesting to me because when I was heavy in new age, there's this mentality in new age that you can just be lazy and not have to work hard. Like you can just have everything come to you. You can manifest everything. You don't have to, you know, struggle. Like you could just, you know, live your best life. And so I thought at that time, like I'm gonna go part-time at work. and. At the time I was having physical problems, I can also talk to you guys about health problems that I had in the past that I think were tied to new age. I'll possibly do a video on that, but I was really struggling at that time and I could have lost my job, guys. Like I was not okay. And I went part-time, I was working 20 hours a week, which is not enough. And the, the rest of that time I was spending doing new age stuff. I wasn't even getting anywhere in life. I wasn't like building a brand. I wasn't doing anything. I did all kinds of different things, but nothing ever stuck, nothing ever worked. And it was just fleeting. Again, this word fleeting just keeps coming up when it comes to new age. Everything is just fleeting. Nothing's solid. There's no grounding. So I was doing things like that. And so during the fast, God's like, you're going to increase your hours. So I increased back to 30 hours. And it's actually been really nice because I feel like I have more of a routine again. So I was missing that discipline and that routine. And that has improved my mood significantly. So yeah, you can see where he's like having me tweak little things here and there. They're not even 
that big of a deal. Like deleting Instagram or increasing hours or whatever it is for you, it's going to be different. But all of this combination together, just starting to really help me heal. Okay, so I'm reading my journal here. And on day three, I was having spiritual warfare. I was having really scary demonic dreams. That was like one of the days I was really, really praying hard to be released from these strongholds on my life. And the enemy was not happy. You know, I didn't have all of my usual suspects. I didn't have my usual coping mechanisms. And all I had was me and God and the enemy wasn't happy. So that was day three. And so here is where things start to turn, take a turn a little bit for, for, the, for the good. So I, I was praying hard that night and it says, after praying in these, for these strongholds to be released, God showed me all of the trauma I've experienced up until now and it just kept coming. So many traumatic events that I forgot about or that I've ignored. Many I tried to heal on my own, which is how I ended up in new age. But these things can only be healed with the Lord, never alone. It's also why I still struggle with addictive behaviors like addicted to my phone or food. It's because these things haven't been dealt with with God. So I remember that I was sitting on the couch and I had just done a really long prayer about trying to be released from this, this depression. And God was just showing me traumatic event after traumatic event after traumatic event. And he was just, it was just like, boom, 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 boom. And I was shook guys. I was not expecting him to show me all those things. There were things that I wouldn't even have considered trauma or I would have glossed over when I was in new age. That I didn't even like think about, or like I forgot about, or just stuff that really affected me. And he was showing me that had affected me and showing me the things that I've experienced in my life that were weighing me down that I needed to be released of and that he was going to help me do that and that I could only do it with him. So that was kind of relieving in a way, even though it was hard. I just, you know, I let God show me those things and I let him touch my heart and I just let him heal me from that. Okay. So I had a couple more horrible days <laughs> reading in this journal. It, it was tough guys. It was not, fasting isn't easy. Like that's one thing I would say, if you've never fasted before and you're trying to heal from something like heavy, like depression, expect to be confronted with your stuff. You know, you don't have your coping mechanisms anymore. So it was tough, very tough, but I let the pain come and the emotion come up and I just trusted. I just trusted. So day eight, I had a dream the night before. Okay. This was, this is wild guys. <laughs> it was one of those vivid, vivid dreams. And it was about three, four in the morning. And I woke up right after. And the dream was of this, this kid that I went to high school with. In the dream, he was laughing and I remember his laugh. I remembered it so well and I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot about him. He would hang out with me and that first boyfriend I mentioned at the beginning, occasionally we would hang out with him. Um, this was right after high school. I just, his, his laugh, he had, such a, he had such a unique laugh and the laugh is what woke me up in the middle of the night. And I was like, I forgot about him. Like, oh my gosh, it's so weird for God to bring him up. Why, why would you bring him up, God? And then it hit me, I forgot that he passed away when we were young, when we were in our 20s. I think he was 26. He died from a motorcycle accident. I think he had been drinking, if I'm not mistaken. And his life was just cut short, you know, he, he passed away. But it, it hurt, like something about it hurt me inside. And I was like, man, he was so unlucky. He didn't get, he didn't get to make it to 35 like I did. Like, how dare I look at this life and not want to be here? You know, there were times when I was not with God and, you know, trying to use his medications and stuff. And I did have SI thoughts. I thought it would be a lot better if I wasn't here. I wish I wasn't here. Like, I just want this over. I want this to end. And I had thoughts like that in new age sometimes too, guys, because those things aren't healing you. They're not, they're a bandaid. So I would have those thoughts. So it just shook me when I remembered him and I was like, he didn't get to have this life. I get to have it. And God wants me here. God wants me here for a reason. He has a purpose for me and he has a purpose for every single one of you. If you're still here, there's a purpose and there's a plan. And a lot of the times he wants to use your pain for good. And I was just so taken back by how I have taken my life for granted and how That guy woke up that morning and he didn't know that it was his last day. He had no idea. He was 26 years old, that he was going to get on his motorcycle and that was it. So I decided that day that I was going to ride my bike. So I rode my bike just to honor him and his life and just to reflect on my life that, you know, I'm still here and, and 
I should be thankful and grateful that I'm still here. I get to be here and make a difference now. I get to share my testimonies. I get to talk to people. I get to experience life, you know, and he doesn't get to do that. I could, I get to maybe have a family one day and he never got to do that. And so God really showed me where my thought process was wrong. You know, the, my thoughts were not positive. So that was major. That's when I really felt like I feel this weight lifting off me now between the trauma stuff and then having that dream. I was like, God is working on me. So I'm looking at my journal and I'm on day 10 and it says this is my last day and it's been so amazing. I feel happier in the last few days of my fast than I ever have in my life. And this time I was like, this doesn't feel like it's fleeting. It feels like it's here. It's like it's here to stay finally. So after that, that was a while ago. So it's been weeks now and every day I wake up and I'm like waiting to go back to my old self and I'm like that that person doesn't exist anymore like I am I am now a happy person my baseline used to be down here each day and now it's up here I just feel happy guys I don't know how that even happened I just I genuinely think it was the combination of all those things him changing things around in my life but also that fasting and that prayer time with God changed me in from the inside out like nothing else could have so if there's anything you take from this video, it's fast, fast for healing, fast for whatever you need help with, fast for your, your friends and your family, fast and pray as you know, multiple times a year. I'll be doing this again for other things, but God can heal you and he wants to heal you. He just wants you to work with him. He doesn't want you to try to do it on your own, guys. I tried to heal stuff on my own for so many years and I never got anywhere. It never... I never was truly healed and he finally showed me true healing. You know, I wake up like excited for the day now. I wake up like happy to be here, happy to serve, happy to share my testimony, happy to just drink a coffee. Like I get so much joy out of the littlest things now. Whereas before I was always grasping for joy, grasping for joy. What, what can make me feel better? What can make me happy? I was looking outside of myself all of this time. And even in new age, you know, they teach you, you can't, you gotta be whole. You can't look outside yourself for things and stuff. And it, that is true. But when you're whole inside because Jesus is filling your heart, it's a completely different type of happy feeling and a, a different type of joy. And it's a beautiful, fulfilling happy and joyful experience. So also if you're interested in fasting, I used a book. The guy's name is Vlad, but he also has a YouTube and he also has a video for each day. So he has all 21 days. So you can fast with him or with his book. And it's really helpful. He uses a lot of scripture in there and to just keep you going when you're, when you're struggling. And it really did help me during my fast. That helped me. It also helped me to just go on a lot of walks, a lot of prayer walks. And just when I was eating, you know, vegetables and stuff. I just, you know, I thanked God every time, you know, thank you for healing me. I was super grateful for it. And I just looked at it. I didn't look at it as I'm lacking things. I looked at it as, oh, I get to have this. I get to have these strawberries. I get to have these yummy smoothies. I get to have these amazing veggie meals. Like I'm so lucky, you know, I just, you know, my mindset was just, thank you, God. Thank you, God. And with that being said, I hope this helps somebody and I love you so much. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in my next video.